What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Love of Scripted Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Wilson, and this is the podcast where we have unscripted conversations with millennials about relationships and dating. So I hope you're having a great start to a new week. Hopefully your week has gotten off on the right foot. Hopefully you had a restful weekend, and I hope that you are just looking for a great week ahead of you. So thank everybody for um, being a part of this journey, being a part of these conversations where we just talk about relationships, not in a way that we try to down each other or um, even try to debate, try to debate some of the most highly talked about topics. But we are really trying to find tools and strategies on how to start and maintain healthy relationships. So for all the OGs, for everyone who's been here since day one, thank you for listening. Um, if you guys are new, last week we had a super dope episode featuring Dr. Myron Edmonds, and we talked about how men can get their shift together. I know there's a lot of comments, there's a lot of concern about how men are actually showing up in the relationship space, and Myron gave us some really dope tips and strategies on how men can get their shift together, because we do believe it starts with us. And men, we want to be able to do things and be able to take control of our own love lives as well. We don't want to just go through life living and just hoping that great things happen. We want it to be more intentional and deliberate about how we go about doing that. So if you missed it, episode 101, Get Your Shift Together is out now. You can find that on all of your favorite streaming platforms. Also, if you guys have not seen recently, we have relaunched the Love Unscripted True Love is Improv apparel line. So if you want to get your True Love is Improv t-shirt, you can head on over to loveunscriptedapparel.com and you can get your t-shirt there. Also, be on the lookout because we do have some new designs and guess what? Hoodie season is close upon us. So we will be releasing our fall line of hoodies. So if you want to support us, we don't take donations. All we ask is that you support through the t-shirt. Or you could share the podcast with a friend. You could share the YouTube channel with a family member that you think could benefit from these conversations. But I will not talk you guys ear off. I know why you came. You're here for these really dope, candid, and authentic conversations. And guess what? This week is no different. I have a really amazing guest. I'm excited because I love talking about this topic. And it's funny because people get all in their feelings sometimes when you talk about this topic. But let me go ahead and get them in here. All right, sir. So go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Brenton Harrison. Uh, I'm a financial advisor. I'm born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. But thanks to Zoom and conference calls and stuff like that, we work all over the country. And I focus on helping families who are typically under the age of 45. Great, great. So another local Nashvillian, Nashville in the building. I try to <laughs> get right, as man. many Nashvillians as possible because I eventually want to do like some kind of like podcast reunion where I get everybody who's been or everyone mm -hmm. from Nashville who's been on the podcast and just have a dope conversation in one room. Of course, after the pandemic, listen, I ain't trying to... <laughs> I ain't trying to get nobody sick and I ain't trying to get nobody's germs, but I just I'm trying to reconnect with people who are here. So um, let's go ahead and get into our segment we've been doing recently and a little bit of get to know you. So our, here is your first question, Brenton. OK. As a therapist, I strongly believe that self-care is important. I believe it should be a daily part of your life, a weekly part of your routine. It should be there. So what are some things that you do when you need to disconnect from the world, kind of get away and to recharge yourself? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll go on a run and I'll, I'll put my phone on airplane mode so that nobody can call me. Nobody can text me or I'll, I'll work out. And then if I'm driving home, you know, I actually hate sitting in traffic. You know, if I, I don't mind uh, being on a back road, but I hate being in the interstate in traffic. So sometimes even if it takes me 15, 20 minutes longer, I'll just take a nice back road on the way home. So I can see some different scenery and I'm not just honking horns on the interstate. So those are the two things really just getting in a position where it's, it's harder for people to communicate with me because I feel like my phone's going all day long. So any opportunity I have to disconnect, that's what I do. Man, I got played one time by Do Not Disturb. I forgot if people, if they're in your favorites and they call you three times, it gets them through. So I love to jog as well. So I'll be jogging. I'll be like in the zone, about to get that runner's high. And then all of a sudden, bleep, bleep, bleep. I'm like, wait, hold on, what? 
I thought I did do not disturb. So I may need uh, to have to tap into that airplane mode so oh, yeah. nobody can get through. You got no service. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'll tell you know, I'll tell my wife when I'm headed out, hey, here's the route that I'm taking just in case she needs me. But I'm I'm good for that. If we if we go on vacation, for example, if there's four people going out to dinner, I'll look at my wife and I'll say, are you bringing your phone? And if she's bringing hers, I just leave mine at home. I think we every everybody needs to have that time where it's just like, hey, I'm just completely disconnected. I'm not disconnected and I'm on social media. I'm completely off my phone. Got you. Got you. And that's listen, that's a whole topic in and of itself is being able to disconnect and not have our phone being part of our hand all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So question, question number two, um, people who watch our and listen to our podcast are very much food enthusiasts. They love food. Somehow every conversation we have, food is <laughs> incorporated. So are you more of a hole in the wall, little off to the side eatery kind of place? Or are you more of a five star fine dining type of experienced person? I just hate chains. I mean, I, I really I can't think of a, of a the last time I ate at a place that had more than like 10 locations. If it's got more than 10 locations, I don't want to eat there. I like, you know, smaller feel, you know, one of one restaurants. I'll go to a place that's really nice that has like some locations in certain areas, but you'd never catch me at like a cheesecake factory. You, no matter how good it is, I just want something that's a little more personal. Okay. I feel you. I definitely feel you on that. I remember one time when we went to New Orleans, um, some of the locals told us like, if you want to eat the really good food, go to the places that don't have signs. I was like, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> don't have signs. And yeah. there are multiple places where the menu is written down. This is the menu for today. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Or some will even go as far as, all right, this is what we're serving today. You have an option between this and this. And normally I'd be like, wait, I don't get to choose. But <laughs> that, that experience, I like the cozy little uh, quaint kind of places. Mm -hmm. All right. So so question number three. A lot of people have been <sighs> binge watching is a thing. People, some people. Are you a TV watcher before I ask? Do you I am. Yeah, I'm. I've. I've I don't binge because I hate the feeling of finishing the show early and it doesn't come on for like another year. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, 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 I watch TV, but I don't binge. Cool. So I had to ask because I've asked this question and some people are like, I don't watch TV. And it's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> OK, let me switch it up. So what are some of the shows that are on your watch list? New shows or just shows I watch frequently? It could be either or. It, you know, I, I grew up, my dad's huge on sitcoms. So I grew up watching Frasier and Seinfeld and, uh, you know, I the Cosby show. Uh, but, you know, really any just old sitcom, I'll watch over and over and over again. In terms of new shows, there's got to be like a million people talking about it for me to pick up on it. So I'll watch, you know, Peaky Blinders, uh, Ted Lasso, I started watching recently. But there's not a, there's so much TV, it's kind of hard for me to latch on to a new show. Got you, got you. Yeah, that's kind of how it is with me. Um, I like sci-fi. I'll watch something that may have multiple seasons if it's good. I was one of those people like, man, Game of Thrones is whack. I watched yeah. like the first episode. I was like, this is whack, and came back three years later. I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> how did I not? So yeah, people, uh, they they love their Netflix. They love their Netflix, especially with the pandemic. People have been inside. I'm pretty sure Netflix and Hulu have been making a killing um, mm -hmm. off of the new subscriptions. So thank you for letting us into your world because you know some people are like, hey, that's that that's very personal information <laughs> uh, about what's on your watch list, and this is a judgment free zone. So thank you for being willing <laughs> to share that information. And so we're gonna go ahead and jump into this topic. Um, and we're going to go ahead and set it up this way. Growing up, I was told there are three things that you don't talk about. I was told it was politics, religion, and money. So of those three things, I happen to really like money. I think money is an extremely useful tool. Think about it, guys. Money has helped me be able to taste so many amazing foods. I've been able to trade money for flights to be able to go to different countries to relax. I have even used money to be able to bring this podcast to you guys. I had to pay for the software, had to pay for the internet connection, had to pay for the microphone equipment. Money has been a really useful tool. But there's one problem. 
there is a mindset and many people are brought up being told that we should not talk to other people about money. And an even bigger challenge comes when you are out there dating or now you're in a relationship with somebody and money does not get discussed. Don't let somebody be getting a raise at work. They will either keep it a secret or they will be shunned for sharing how much of a raise they got by their superiors. So, Brenton, I want to have a conversation about money. And, and I think money has been given a bad rap, has been given, uh, has been demonized by many cultures and communities as being um, evil in some sort. So here's the first question. Let's let's start here. Why do you think so many parents, so many people have have raised us to not talk about money and finances with other people? I think when you when you have a parent who might have endured or observed their own financial trauma and shame, then there's a tendency to look at that child and whether it's they're embarrassed that they're not further ahead than they thought they'd be at a particular age, they might tell their child, you know, we can't talk about that. And it may it may truly just be they're embarrassed to talk to their child about money because they are not where they want to be or they might just be in a position where there's a lot of guilt associated with it. You know, when I was coming into this industry, I remember somebody telling me people will talk about their sex life before they talk about their money with you. And that's very true. You know, you you have these feelings that come down to you from other people. And if you're not part of that breaking of the cycle, you're going to just pass that on to the next generation. So if you were raised not to talk about money, you're going to raise somebody else not to talk about money. And you build up this barrier where it becomes this more and more taboo topic when in actuality, there are some common threads that you can share with people that could really break down some of those barriers. Mm, I like that. So one of the one of my earliest memories about or surrounding money was one of my birthdays. One of my uncles gave me like twenty dollars, and I was super hyped. I was like, "Oh, I got a twenty dollar bill. Never seen one of these. I wonder what all I could buy with this." And I went around showing my cousins. I'm like, "Hey, look, look at this. I got twenty dollars for my birthday." Hey, and my mom pulls me aside. Is like, "Stop, stop showing everybody that you have money. You don't need to tell everybody the money that you have or how much you have." And from that conversation, I was like, "Oh, so when I have money." I can't tell anybody. So <laughs> it got to the point where I would even with my mom sometimes, she'd be like, how much money do you have in your pocket? Even as a, like a young kid, I'm like, I can't say. I was afraid <laughs> not to tell anybody. So it even backfired on her where I was scared to talk to anybody about money. And, and that was kind of ingrained in me at an early age. And I think as we become older, we can take that into our dating and relationship lives. Mm -hmm. So here's the, so here's the next thing. What do you think makes it difficult for us as adults or people who are dating or in newly formed relationships to even have that conversation about money? Every 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 relationship that I've ever had the privilege of of being a part of in terms of managing their finances there's going to be one person who has a completely different financial philosophy than the other. If not completely different, they're definitely not going to be the exact same. You might have a budgeter. You might have someone who's more freewheeling. You might have someone, they might have the same economic background, but how they manage their finances can be different. So that becomes a part of a conversation that needs to be had in a relationship, but it's tough to have. And if you don't have it, it can create conflict. So the, the older you get and without having had that conversation, if you're with the person that you've been with for a long time, it just becomes that unspoken thing that needs to be discussed that hasn't been. And the older you get and you haven't had that connection with anybody, like if you've been single for a longer period of time and maybe you get into a relationship later in your dating life, it becomes even harder to have because now it's something where you're like, am I exposing a part of myself a bit too soon? And when do you have that conversation in a new relationship? Mm, definitely. I, and I want to go to that part where you said share a part of yourself. Mm. It, it sounds like many people attribute some type of personal value to how much money they have. How can yeah. that be a dangerous mindset to have just as an individual going through life, a tying your personal value and worth to money? 
it's not just money to me it's occupation as well you know mm. it's especially in communities of color uh an advanced degree an advanced title can become a person's identity right and it's it's not that they don't deserve accolades but you have people where it's like if you ask them about themselves one of the first two things they'll say is i'm a doctor or i'm a phd or i'm this or i'm that and you should be proud of those accomplishments but when you venture into the point of saying that these things define who i are who i am then when any of those things are stripped from you or when any of those things no longer bring you joy what do you have left to identify yourself you could be a physician for the rest of your life, but if you no longer find joy in seeing your patients, the thing that you consider your identity now causes you stress. What do you have to identify yourself with outside of that thing? Or if you identify yourself based on how much money you have, you know, you'd be surprised how you can be humbled when it comes to your money. And when it's taken from you, what about your personality remains where you can find another outlet to identify yourself? Oh, <laughs> got you, got you. So not allowing even the the source of the money to have so much importance that it dictates how you view yourself um, and kind of just understanding like how you feel about your occupation and, and being honest with that and not letting that dominate who you are, because there's there's like there's other parts to you. Yeah. And if you if you identify yourself with the money that you have, either it will be taken from you and you'll have to find something else or it won't be taken from you. But you'll realize there's never enough. Right. If, if you identify yourself with money, you constantly have to have have more and more and more and more and more. And if it ever slows down, what do you have then? And, bro, every millennial, it seems like everybody's an entrepreneur now. It seems like everybody has jumped into the entrepreneurship field and the way that I see money going with entrepreneurship, I know they have different philosophies about um, what they would like for money to be, um, how they would like to spend their money and, and spending habits among people, just like you said, overall can be different. So what I tend to see is when couples who have different spending habits, they tend to fight more over lifestyle fight more so over how we show up in the world. They tend to fight over where the finances are going and how they are allocated. Do you think people necessarily have to have similar spending habits in order to, let's say if they're a couple, to reach financial goals that they may have? I don't think they have to have the same spending habits, but if they don't, they need to communicate thoroughly about a, a middle ground, right? Like if you handle your finances one way and I handle my finances another, we need to talk about a middle ground because it, it goes deeper. One of the things you said is you talked about your first money memory, you know, getting that $20 bill. There are studies that show that the overwhelming majority of our philosophies about how we view money is fully formed before we're 10 years old, wow. positively or negatively. There's something that you saw modeled where you either said, that's what I associate with a positive thing about money. And I'm going to try to emulate that. Or there's a feeling that you felt or something you saw somebody else go through. And you said, I'm never going to go through that. So you're trying to run away from it. You might be trying to run away from poverty or you might have seen somebody who you thought had money. So now you're trying to do everything that you think that they did to have money. So the reason that's important in the concept of a context of a relationship is you, you have an emotional connection to how you manage your money. And if your spouse is not in tune with how handling your money makes you feel and how you feel when it's not being handled the way you want to, it, it becomes more than just money. Right. Like if wow. you don't realize that the way that you do your budget is because it gives you a feeling of security, then you won't be able to vocalize to your spouse when you don't follow my budget. It makes me feel like I'm not secure. And maybe that's something I need to work on. But until I've got it figured out, can we have a conversation about what the way you're spending your money makes me feel or how it makes me feel? And then that spouse can also say, all right, well, here's why I don't have that same philosophy and why you trying to make me do it your way is a problem for me. That has to be a part of the conversation. OK, so I like where you're going with this, because a lot of people do not associate money decisions with feelings, mm -hmm. with emotions. People tend to look at it in matters of 
zeros and do- and decimals, dollars yeah. and cents. How yeah. can someone start to become more aware of how they actually feel? Because I, I can only imagine, especially if you're working with couples and they haven't had this conversation, some of the looks that are on people's faces, mm-hmm. uh, some of the hesitancy to commit to certain things. Like, how can somebody start to even within themselves be able to identify like, what is it I'm feeling about money? Yeah, I, to me, the hardest question to ask yourself is why is why is this thing that I'm holding on to so important to me? You know, and, and it doesn't mean that it's not important. It just why is it so important to me? You know, my wife and I have had conversations. We got we we've had combined finances since we were 24 years old. Right. So like at a very young age, when we're very immature and you think, you know, everything in the world, but you really know <laughs> not as much as you as you believe. Um we're sitting here trying to find that balance. It was very difficult. And we had a lot of fights about money. And it wasn't until we'd been married a little while longer where she was able to express to me, you know, when you're hounding me about these things, it doesn't make me feel like you're my spouse. It makes me feel like you're my father. And it doesn't make me feel any more inclined to do the things that you're asking because we're not partnering. You're, you're being condescending. That's how that's how she felt. And to me, it was condescending to her. But to me, I'm sitting there saying there's something that I feel is important to me. And I've asked you not to do this or to do that. And you do it anyways, which makes me feel not heard. And again, that's not money. That has everything to do with how are we communicating as partners? Are we actually being partners? Are we communicating the feelings that we're expressing by not saying anything at all, right? Like I can say, oh no, it's really not that big a deal to me. It is that big a deal to me if we keep coming back to the same place. Definitely. Communication is extremely important in all aspects of relationship, especially in finances, especially Mm -hmm. with planning. And think about it, many millennials are getting older, having children now. That's a Mm -hmm. mix that we didn't really have 10 years ago. We weren't thinking about that. We were like, okay, how, how are we going to live? We, we just got <laughs> married. Now we into our career or we may be changing a career that was on our mind, but now, okay, retirement is not too far in the distance. We're in a mm-hmm. pandemic. We got to start planning differently. So communication is extremely important. One thing that is also happening with millennials is that they are postponing marriage longer but they're also dating much longer. So we're starting to see a lot more five to seven year relationships. Mm -hmm. And one uh, sentiment that I hear a lot is I will wait to talk about money for real uh, until I know that we are extremely serious or I'll wait until we're married to actually Mm -hmm. let you into my financial situation. What can, what can be the, some of the pitfalls or what could be some of the dangers if you wait until the last minute to start discussing finances with a potential partner or a future spouse? To me, that's the equivalent of, of saying, I'm going to tell my spouse what my love language is after we get married, you know, like because the way that you spend money, it, it, it is connected to an emotion. It's connected to a feeling that you have, you know, and also just the the state of your finances is something that your spouse will have to deal with. So to leave that off of the table, it to me is withholding a crucial part. Excuse me. Allergies are killing me, man. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm struggling over here. I'm trying. Um, you know, it, to me, it's withholding a crucial part of the equation of your relationship. And that's not to say that money is all that there is to a relationship, but any part of your life that your spouse is going to have to deal with that you withhold, that's that's going to be tough on them to have said, you know, you could have told me before and you withheld and now I'm dealing with it. And I didn't get the opportunity to choose whether this was something that I could deal with. Mm hmm. And think about it. Listen, talking about money with someone that you're either dating, even even in marriage, it can be vulnerable to talk about financial situations. Mm -hmm. And I think the one way you can tell potentially if someone is for you or could potentially be the right one is how do you guys communicate about very difficult topics? Money being one of those things. You're going to have to live. You're going to have to support yourself. So every first, 15th, 30th of the month, 
you're going to be having to reevaluate or communicate about your financial situation. And it's not something we can just push off. Luckily, there are people like Brenton who can help you guys out and and get some information on that. But here's one thing that I, I want to like, let, let's shift the conversation a little bit. Talking about money actually can have some benefits. People have been almost shamed and feared into not talking about money so much that they don't even know if there's even an upside. So what could be some of the potential benefits of opening up with your partner or your spouse about your finances? You learn more about what makes you tick. Some of those questions are questions you might not have even asked yourself before. Um, you learn more about what makes your spouse tick and what makes them feel vulnerable, what makes them feel secure. And secure doesn't mean that, you know, we have a million dollars in the bank. It could just be, excuse me, it could just mean that, you know, we're talking and discussing and that makes me feel better as opposed to it just being hidden. Um, so that could be something that's that's a benefit. You know, the other part of it is, again, it's not that money is everything. But it is a part of your relationship that, like you said, is going to rear its head every single month. Bills rear their head every single month. So if you think that you are benefiting yourself by avoiding it, you may be a spouse that can do that well. But if your other half is not, then that's just something that's that's a, a hidden hurt that they're experiencing every 30 days. Oof. And listen, the anxiety that can come from that, you want to like alleviate that. Listen, I try to tell people, Brenton, marriage is tough enough already. Mm -hmm. It's tough enough. If there are some things that we can have conversations about and take some of the stress off the table, why not go ahead and do that? So I do have a question that someone asked on Instagram when I told them we're going to be talking about money. And they wanted to know, are people, are people who have more money happier together than people who have less money no uh, it, it may be that there are certain arguments that someone without money is having that someone with money is having but money is not everything so if the core of that relationship is still trash they're just having different arguments <laughs> so it's, it's really just a matter of if we're not solid we're fighting about different things so <laughs> so here, here's another thing I always hear people say, OK, people say that, but I'd rather cry in a Lambo than than be uh, be in a Honda or something like that. So think about that phrase. Like when you hear that, how do you like what are some thoughts you have? Because I'm pretty sure you being in the financial realm, you'll hear people who say, oh, I'd rather just be wealthy and sad than to be happy in a Camry or something like that. <laughs> It's, it's the same answer I gave when it comes to you associating yourself with the amount of money that you have. If you have money and you're still not happy, then you don't you still have not identified what will make you happy. So I, I agree. I don't want to you know, I'd rather be in a Lambo than a than a car that. I'm oh, yeah, sorry. Um, no, you're good. I'd rather I'd rather be in a Lambo than in a car that, you know, is, is having trouble getting from point A to pay, point B. Um, but you know, I, I know people who are very happy with less and I know people who are miserable with more. So you still got to figure out what it is that makes you happy. Mm, definitely. So we're going to go ahead and transition into our last segment of the show, which is flip the script. And flip <laughs> the script is the segment of the show where our guest provides a simple tool or strategy for how to deal with a certain situation or challenge that we discussed in this episode. So Brenton, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. So there may be a couple out there on their couch listening to this podcast episode and they may be like, yo, we haven't had that conversation yet about our finances and we dare not even talk about money. What is one thing a couple can do to start the process of having the conversation about their finances? There are two different methods that with with clients i've tried i've tried it personally and it's been beneficial to to my relationship um the hardest thing is talking about money in the moment right like somebody overspent let's talk about it right now to me there should be a time on your calendar where you guys agree that you're going to talk about money but you should take the stress out of the moment as much as possible. It could be that you go pick up some food from your favorite restaurant. Maybe you watch your favorite TV show or your movie before you discuss it. 
then you talk about it. If you don't feel like you can do that, I've told people, hey, you go in a room, the other person go in another room and write down what it is about the way you guys are handling your money makes you feel. How does it make you feel? And exchange it. Don't talk about it. Like just take it, take a day, read what your spouse wrote and then come back to it. And then when you come back to it, still try to try to take as much stress out of it as possible. But to me, the worst thing that you can do is talk about <laughs> Excuse me, talk about a tense subject in the moment. The best thing that you can do is try to make it as fun as possible, even though it's not something that's naturally fun. All right. There you guys have it. Brenton, thank you for joining us this week. Yeah, my apologies, man. It's the, the day that the pollen is like the worst in my uh, around my house. And I, I decided to hop on a live webinar, but hopefully it was still valuable. <laughs> it's, it's all good. So please let everybody know where they can find you on the Internet and social media. Sure. You can find me uh, on my website, BrentonHarrison.com. You can also find me on YouTube, Brenton Harrison Financial Advisor. Uh, we have videos that we post on basic financial literacy, tools and tips that can help you when it comes to the money conversation. And those are the two best places to reach me. All right. And I will put all of his information in the show notes. So please don't try to click it while you're driving because we can't <laughs> help you guys with any kind of car repairs or anything like that. We are not liable. So I want to thank everybody who tuned in and was willing to have this conversation with us. Please head on over to iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher Podcast, comment, rate, and subscribe. If you're in podcast land, please head on over to Love Unscripted HD on YouTube where you can see the full video for this episode. Also, if you want to support the podcast, go ahead and head on over to loveunscriptedapparel.com and that's where you can uh, buy some of our merchandise and our apparel line. So I thank everybody for listening. Guess what? We may not have all the answers, but we will have the conversation. I'll see you guys next week. Peace.